Yes. Um, how's everybody doing? So um, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to start um, by going through my website and just showing you a little bit of a chronology, reverse chronology of, uh, or maybe chron chron chronologic or maybe just organic kind of uh, sprawling talk here about my practice through my website. Um, so it's something you can then refer to if there's something that interests you there uh, for some reason. And um, so, two minutes, one minute. So I can just talk informally here. Um, so my um, background, um, I had not started as a freshman in an art school context, I had started uh, at the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, University of Illinois, in Champaign. Um, I think Josh went. Yes. So we did not meet there. And um, I was not interested in art at that time. And I went through school about three years and discovered um, through friends and through some peers um, the art sort of context. And I really was drawn to it, so promptly left that liberal arts education to pursue um, an art, arts education. So. Two years out, sort of learning about uh, how the art, you know, how art functions and what uh, what that involves, or at least trying to learn about it. Uh, then matriculated to the School of the Art Institute in 2002, um, where I focused more or less thinking about painting um, and flat work, and um, just starting to really think about sculpture in, a, in a, a little bit. By the end of that time, I started to collaborate with with another artist named Justin Hanch. Um, who had now since moved to California to do his own thing. Um, but that was the seeds of what um, I have sort of developed in my practice um, in the years since then. So since 2003, I've moved from thinking about the studio as the only place to make work, uh, the studio as a place where you then work out ideas and you have your process. And um, at a certain point, I started to you know, um, think about collaboration as a really, um, a really strong way to build ideas, to um, develop ideas, not in a vacuum um, necessarily, though for some artists, which is you know, not to discount the idea of the studio, I still do maintain a certain studio practice, which you'll see, um, but that the dialogue uh, can produce something uh, between two or multiple people in a way, so through their work or literally through studio visits at meetings. So that being said, um, we'll look at some of this. This is my website here. Um, and I downloaded it using a, a program called Sightsucker. So, so if there's no Wi-Fi in your lecture, you could do that too. Anyways, um, we'll start right here. Um, in between undergrad and graduate school, I'd taken two years um, to teach in an all-girls Catholic high school in Wicker Park. And um, teaching high school is, was uh, rewarding on one level, but also, you know, um, sometimes challenging. So I promptly had applied to go to the University of Illinois Chicago uh, MFA program in studio arts uh, where I um, was with Dennis. So he had um, you know, graduated at the same time or um, you know, were there at the same time. And it was here where I started to develop and flesh out a lot of these early ideas of working with people, collaborating and whatnot. And um, so um, and I started to characterize myself as um, what you might call a curator and someone who um, assembles different, different bodies of work from artists or works with artists to make a project of theirs happen in a space. Um, but I would still categorize myself in a lot of ways primarily as an artist. So, um, so thinking about how to um, not just select and choose little different pieces of, you know, oh, this painting will go on this group show and this sculpture will go in front of it. Um, you know, which again is a valid way to work, but for me, you know, really try to get into thinking about how to uh, make this into an art practice and how to make curating as a creative artistic expression in and of itself. So, um, so you'll see these sculptures, they start to uh, think about this that way. So I'll start, um, and these are projects which are maybe, let's see here, um, we'll go with We'll go with this one. So this is a project which is from 2007, I believe. And this is called Vanishing Point. And the Vanishing Point um, was a project that was at the Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago. And it was um, hosted in the uh, main sort of really uh, dramatic stairwell that goes up there. So what it consists of is a large number of items that were packed in this suitcase and taken to 
the gallery, um, a hole was drilled in the floor and an eye, um, a screw eye was put in the floor and a number of clotheslines were strung up uh, to the ceiling. Um, so um, using this structure, this underlying structure, I was able to exhibit other people's work as, as well as ephemera and other kinds of uh, materials that I've gathered over the years as part of my archive, part of my collection. So you start to see how instead of just curating and putting things on the wall, you start to engage the idea of a uh, specific area, site-specific sort of uh, situation where um, you know, the rising of the pieces, mimicking or at least um, sort of um, um, fitting into the staircase, um, you know, its own sort of ascension in a way. So, so you see, again, there's a lot of different kinds of work and they're you know, more or less clip haphazardly onto there. Um, so it's about these sort of particulate things and uh, sort of the broader picture and structure. So, and uh, you know, the interpretation is that these objects can be flowing into the luggage as some kind of net or capturing device or something that you might travel and then it would then explode all this content. So, you know, partially it's about, you know, the things we keep with us, uh, ideas and um, those type of experiences that you might um, carry with you. So, so I'll move. there's one last really nice, uh, not that one, here we go. So that's a view from the top. Um, this painting is not part of it, but so you see these different threads and um, yeah, so it was up for the summer and people were really um, interested in me using this actual space where no art generally ever existed in this um, shaft of, uh, you know, space in between the stairs. So, okay, so we'll go back, close that up. So every time I will make a piece, um, I kind of, uh, I'm not a big fan of mixed media, so I like to think about very much the specificity of what's happening. And you'll see that when I talk a little bit about the show here, uh, there's very much a kind of specificity at work. And uh, you know, if you've read the catalog or uh, pamphlet, you'll see a little bit of that, um, those ideas at play. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the materials list for the piece. This is the materials list um, right here. Uh, and maybe I'll back up a little bit. Um, this would be a image, uh, this is the title list for my um, MFA thesis exhibition, well one part of it, and it is the contents of my studio then packed up. Um, so you'll see a very large list of items as well that I had used uh, that were in my possession at that time of having finished school. So um, again, another chance to display objects in a way and the way that they might be displayed sculpturally um, is sort of relevant to the, the situation I'm in, um, the situation of the exhibition, and, uh, and even spatial spatial types of situations. Um, but this one was more about a kind of uh, marking, marking of, you know, a development of my, my practice, which is, you know, what an MFA really is about. So, yep, covered with glass, so you could put your, you know, your coffee on there, coffee table. So, and you can, you can make what you will of that statement. Um, so, we will move, uh, yes. Mixed media being a catch-all kind of term that, yeah, not mixed media, yeah, not to say mixed media rather than to, um, you know, unfold or unpack what, what materials you are using. So, um, in between grad school and undergrad, I had um, a exhibition space that I opened in Chicago with a friend at the time, and uh, it was called Art Ledge, a very kind of uh, strange name, and. Um, as you might know, in Chicago, there's a very big tradition and history of creating apartment galleries. And an apartment gallery is a place that uh, people exhibit um, in maybe a room of their house that's been cleared out, or maybe, um, maybe they would you know, put work all over their house or with the furnishings they have. And um, you know, I had visited my friend Seth and we saw this little architectural oddity. And uh, this, this happens very frequently and very fast development in certain neighborhoods. And you'll see that not a lot of care is taken to how one might actually live in a space. So you have this little space right here, and this is the art ledge. And this um, was an exhibition venue for three years. And we had shown um, literally the work of maybe um, 30 to 50 artists. And we were also asked to uh, exhibit and curate um, around uh, different venues, not just in this space. So we were able to work um, as young artists, working with a lot of 
um, people that were uh, around us, our peers, but also working with new people that, um, you know, we were, whose work we were excited about. So we've had, um, you know, both uh, Dennis and Ben and John uh, I've worked with in the past. So, and, uh, so, you know, you can look on this later at home and, uh, and see sort of the list of artists that are, you know, some still working in Chicago, some not. And here's a picture of us. <laughs> so, anyways, um, so, so that was my first curatorial venture, and again, it was, you know, we were young and, um, you know, really kind of um, thinking about really just trying to get our, uh, getting our um, sort of ideas out there, and, uh, but also mobilize community of sorts. So that was my first uh, real serious go at thinking about curating as an art practice. And um, by using this very strange limitation, we were able to push artists to work in ways they maybe weren't used to, and in, um, you know, so we, we would not want artists to then just get a painting and put it on the wall, but, you know, we invite them and then they would come and actually, um, you know, sit with us and think about what are the possibilities of this space, this really um, absurd shaped space. So um, the solution Ben Foch had was to um, create a, what was called a frustum, which was also the name of the show, which was to bisect the space uh, using uh, wall drawing. So um, uh, there, are, there aren't any pictures of these shows uh, yet, but we're not. We're not really sure what's going to happen with all that archive material. So, um, currently, in a similar, um, similar process, uh, a similar project is a, uh, is a gallery in Pilsen, an area of Chicago called Ben Russell. And that is an apartment gallery that I have where we have um, very sort of specific restrictions for the artists, some of which are having to fill a wall three quarters of the wall, having to fit a piece between certain size wall, half the size, having a sculpture garden outside in the back that would be required to be all weather, and a uh, screening room which, would, which requires the artist to use 5.1 Dolby system and uh, other sorts of parameters like that. So we have a show coming up on Saturday. Um, I need to uh, plug, but anyway, so this is our calendar and we have um, you know, we have a pretty good um, list of artists and shows, but the, the underlying structure and how we then determine what the themes will be are based on an anagram of Ben Russell's name. And Ben Russell, I don't live at this space, he actually is the person on the lease, which is what we decided, why we decided to name the gallery this way. Um, so all, as you'll see, all these um, names are, all the names of these shows are based on his name. So again, another limitation, really a good way for an artist to give them a kind of freedom, which is, which is odd, maybe, to think about. So. Okay, so there's an image of that online as well. So we'll move right along here. Um, okay. Maybe I'll just show this one, because Ben's also in it. I'll show this video right here. It's very quick. Um, actually, there's no sound. There's no sound. I should ask for sound now. That's okay. You can watch this online. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, we'll just go to this. Okay, so this is the project that really started giving me a lot of um, a lot of energy and a lot of sort of um, um, push to develop in, into a sort of bigger place. And this is called the Silver Galleon Press. And I was um, lucky to be invited or actually accepted. Um, to be a resident at a venue, now defunct venue, called Incubate, and it was in the uh, Logan Square area of Chicago. And it was a small researched institute. Uh, Josh had done a project there right before. You guys, so. you guys did, yes. So they did a project right before me. And it's, it's, uh, it's not a gallery per se. They do have a storefront gallery type of uh, situation, but they used it for, um, to host artists from other towns, host artists in town uh, to enact and um, support the projects they're interested in, and not in a way where you would have, again, paintings on the wall or things like that, which have happened, um, but really giving you a infrastructure or support group for, you know, finding people to work with, finding materials, um, helping out with promotion, think a, lo a lot of sort of uh, ancillary things, but also helping you to theorize and, um, you know, characterize the work uh, for yourself as these uh, individuals who are running the space where um, graduate students at the School at Art Institute not as artists or art historians, but as art administrators slash historians. So really thinking about how to, again, support a community, support a, uh, a network of uh, you know, like-minded uh, people.
people. So, um, so what the press is, is a um, independent publishing project that I um, do by myself. And often there are some help, um, but all the material, all the content is collected by me um, and not written by me, possibly edited. But it was born out of reading um, and having things that I've read that I've wanted to share with people. So a large chunk of the text, how this was initiated, were all those PDFs that you might be getting in your classes. And uh, so I started to print them out. Um, so I might make notations on them and bring them with me on the train. And it started to, you know, I started to collect this pile. And this was before it was even an art project. And eventually, I started making covers for these. And so I proposed to do this at this incubate place. And they provided all this uh, structure for me to operate. So um, the text are pulled from online sources, which is uh, generally more or less, w I think, where I read the most, uh, standing, sitting in front of the computer reading. So I get pretty dis dissatisfied with that. So uh, a lot of the texts are hard to find texts that are found online, um, possibly through having to look you know, very deeply into certain kinds of um, you know, websites that have uh, repositories of different kinds of files. So this was one of them, and this is the one that um, uh, initiated the whole series. So this is, these are all hand-bound um, books using very cheap materials, um, very um, accessible materials, meaning you know, brackets from the office store and things like that, printed at home very cheaply. And a lot of this had to do with the kind of economics of purchasing ink. Uh, uh, ink, I think, for an Epson commercial printer costs at least 20 to $40 for black ink. I was able to find ink that could be 99 cents to $5. So by avoiding the warranty, I was able to save quite a bit of money um, to print these. So I determined that a page could be printed out for a penny. And I think uh, the going rate for a, pa a page at Z Kinko's would be like seven cents or 10 cents. So you start to see, like, I was interested in leveraging the kind of, the kind of economy that I could um, find within these systems. So, um, so, you know, looking at this cover, obviously this is a book, Hatred of Capitalism. And it's just a way to frame what it is I'm doing and thinking about how to operate within a system um, and possibly critique it, but also um, leverage it and use as much of it as possible um, for your own gain and for the gain of your, um, you know, again, your like-minded, um, you know, peers and artists. So here's the first setup, um, literally just like the books uh, splayed out on the table, and they were for sale. But because some of the material is, uh, you know, copyright restricted and things like that, I sold them um, by the ounce, much like produce. Um, so people would then have to weigh the books and buy them that way. Um, so here's another shot of it. So, you know, part of it was um, laying these out in a kind of informal market way, in the same way you might lay out fruit and vegetables. So, uh, um, or you might find in a place like uh, Maxwell Street where CDs are laid out on a table or on a rug or something like that. So, again, a kind of um, human-scaled way of distributing artworks and distributing, you know, this kind of material. But they are uh, artworks in and of themselves, as much as they're... Um, curated slash edited publications, you know, these, these covers are handmade. These covers are, um, you know, pasted, they're painted. You'll see this one right here is actually an oil painting on, um, on the book there, and other ones are collage and digital collage and et cetera. Lately, I've been much more um, deliberate in the approach, not so scattershot with the different styles, and uh, so you'll, as you'll see, so. Here is the minimum requirements to create such a project, and it's a project that I urge other people to also do, and I host a lot of workshops in order to teach this process um, to print and publish work very cheaply and easily. And uh, I mean, I've had people go on and make you know, little pamphlets and magazines or zines with their friends to then distribute and sell. Um, but literally, it's paper, a computer, and a printer, right? So there's all these different tricks that you might do to make things not just look like a uh, throwaway, takeaway thing, but actually leave someone with something they want to keep and put in their bookshelf. So it ends up being partially a sculpture on their bookshelf, in their desk, in their bag. Okay, so part of it is, again, a kind of sculptural practice as well, or even painterly practice. Okay, um, so here's one. This was a, um, a project where I was commissioned to make this, and it's a reprint of a book uh, that was published in the 80s. Very hard to find catalog someone was able to obtain through um, the artist who was in this show. It's a very 
um, prominent political art group in New York in the 80s. So I reprinted this book for that artist through the Silver Galleon Press um, imprint. Okay? The Silver Galleon Press name um, is a name that I, I can stand behind. Often my names are like, or titles, you know, but this one I'm really, um, I'm really uh, interested in because the Silver Galleon is in reference to a very specific thing, which was um, the Galleon trade um, that traveled from uh, the east to uh, Mexico and back to transfer spices and other kinds of cultural goods back and forth um, was what I was trying to locate. Uh, and uh, there, the reason this, this um, galleon, I'm sorry, um, the reason why the galleon trade was existing was because Spain was hoping to then transfer material from Asia to Mexico to then carry over land and then put on another ship to then go through the Atlantic Ocean. So you're seeing like Spain having to avoid traveling really dangerous waters, so circumventing it by going the other way. So you start to see a lot of um, um, correlation between materials being transferred, ideas being transferred very subtly between the Philippines and Mexico. And the Philippines was the dock for all these ships to travel um, to and fro. So you start to have this funny, very subtle, um, gradual uh, sharing of information. So it's sort of think of this as partially yeah, a pirate thing, but also you know, um, this trade type of thing too. So, and the silver is in reference to like literally silver that was being transported from Mexico, which is very full of silver uh, to China. So, uh, so that's a good segue to this new uh, piece. I've had a number of uh, shows and things happen very recently. Uh, we'll start, um, okay, let's see here, okay. Maybe we'll, We'll just start here. This is the, a show that happened in late September um, with a group called Parking Space, and the three curators had invited me to exhibit a work in their show, which was based around sort of, um, um, I guess, punk and goth culture in a way, and how that culture has been exhausted and sold back to itself. So it's really critical of the idea of youth culture and uh, thinking about how these kinds of cultural expectations or cultural uh, forms actually can exist in a, in, a, in a way that actually might be um, contrary to their actual ideals. Uh, so I was invited to this show, and um, the parking space curators, the reason why they call themselves parking space, they occupy other spaces when they're invited. So um, in any case, the point is, this is a project called Portable Void, and it's based on um, portable hole, a portable hole that you might remember from like cartoons, where they would have a hole and they'd throw it, and then you can like jump into that hole and then take the hole with you. Um, so it's a way to be in two places at once in some ways. Uh, but the also idea of like pure blackness and the idea of pure abstraction. So and what, what you're looking at is a photocopy um, made by lifting the lid on a Xerox machine. So literally it's taking a copy of nothing. So, and you'll see that it's an addition of infinity 2000 to infinity. So this is something infinitely reproducible because there's really copy machines anywhere. Um, so these were put around the city, documented, and uh, the documentation was exhibited in the show, as well as posters people were able to take home. But you'll find that, you know, beyond it just being a process piece or conceptual piece, that you know, a pure black texture of toner is a very beautiful and seductive material in a way, a very everyday material. But you'll see that um, it links up with a lot of histories, a, um, a lot of histories regarding um, you know, abstract painting and uh, you know, the void, which is uh, something that you know, an artist like Ed Reinhardt might talk about, or, um, Kazimir Malevich, who you might remember from your, um, you know, from your art history. So, okay, so um, show that opened a week after that one is this one called Future Shock, and it was a uh, a publishing uh, venture, which was a, a lot more sort of developed in terms of a focused publishing published book, so this, this was a hundred copies and have never done a run that big of one thing, at least at one time. And uh, I was invited to the show called Future Shock, and the Future Shock show is about technology surpassing the ability for culture to um, understand it. And that um, at a certain point there is this anxiety and um, 
you know, this sort of inability to wrap one's head around the kind of complexity and intensity that um, technology might bring. So um, the show opens with this. This is the website. Um, and this is the, the show opens with this uh, stack of books here. And this is the original book um, written by Alvin Toffler, a futurologist. And uh, he had prophesized a lot of the things that we are experiencing now, um, such as you know, globalization and you know, sort of worldwide web kind of availability of transfer of information, et cetera. So this is a stack of books by an artist, Randall Sutton. He's collected these over time, saying it was probably one of the most discarded books in America. And whether that's true or not is uh, beside the point, but you know, what does the past idea of the future look like now? It looks like this, a kind of sad little pile of books and colors faded and et cetera. Um, books that maybe no one reads anymore. So he has taken it upon himself to start collecting these books. So it ends up being kind of this funny piece. So responding to that, and again, always trying to make something very specific uh, to the context I'm in. Um, so I created these books here, which are actually a copy of the books that he presented, and then uh, except bound um, around blank pages. So uh, viewers are invited to take these away with them or purchase them uh, and use them, right? So they're about providing a person with a, a kind of tool or, or platform to them for themselves to you know, create their own future, I suppose. Okay, so I can show you the installation of that here in a sec. How are we doing on time? Um, we've got about 20. Okay, I'll speed it up. I'll speed it up. Okay, so um, so here's his piece. What I had done was took a mirror and put it under his piece because um, he said do whatever you want. Uh, with the book, so I did put these, uh, put the mirror under there, so it looks like it's growing, and uh, same thing here. So, so it suggests like this infinity of, you know, um, distribution, uh, but also this uh, hall of mirrors effect with the book, future, past, present, that kind of thing. But also look like a cool, so. Okay. Okay. So where are we at? Okay. Um, there's a few more things, but uh, maybe I'll finish with this. Right now, before I show some of these images that I have, talk a little bit about this show here. So what you're seeing is the front of a, uh, front of a building at 2606 North California, and it is a new project that is, um, this is where my studio is, but now uh, I was um, awarded what's called Propeller Grant by um, two institutions, uh, Gallery 400, connected to the University of Illinois Chicago and Three Walls, a not-for-profit organization in Chicago. And they pulled some money together in addition to being supported by the Andy Warhol Foundation to provide artists um, funding, you know, a small amount of funding to help as seed money for their projects. And the projects um, had to have the parameter that they were in public as well as um, involve the public in some way, but also provide opportunity for others. So, um, which is partially why I have um, really was drawn to curating because A, you get to be with people more and talk about ideas, talk through ideas, but also if you're one to give people opportunity, opportunity will also be presented to you because then it's a kind of shared, shared gain. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so Propeller Fund, that's there, so uh, good to really you know, um, apply to stuff like this, you never know. So, okay, so moving right along. So this will be really quick. I will just show you, um, let's see if we can. Uh, so as you might know, we, uh, as a group, took an excursion to the Governor State Sculpture Garden. And uh, what, what you have here is a very, very raw, unedited um, group of pictures of our trip. So pardon for any kind of sloppiness here in terms of its um, presentation. So but I'll just go through them really quickly. You guys might know that. Uh, that's a really beautiful two sets of vapor trails that I saw. Um, here's another one. This is that bridge down there on 127th, right? You see this? You're sort of wondering, why is he showing us this? This is the drive from Chicago. The point is, is that we really wanted to draw a, um, you know, again, mark a kind of or help us to navigate a kind of um, 
shift from living in a city, moving, um, you know, tra traveling through a space to here, and then traveling from here to the sculpture garden. So you start to see um, uh, a, a change in texture, a change in the grain of, a, of your landscape. And um, so you'll see uh, there's also some really nice moments in this. Um, you'll see a little bit of, okay. Um, so this is that bridge you might have dri driven over. I'm just trying to give a little context to um, the trip here and the kind of landscape maybe that I'm not necessarily sort of uh, familiar with at all, at all times. So, you know, not to say that we are coming in as tourists, but um, in some ways I find this um, sort of, uh, you know, interesting and worth, worth analyzing and worth analyzing, not just on an anthropological level, but a visual level and an experiential level. So, so here's this. I thought this might be um, something good to show. Um, car dealership. Here's that bridge again. Okay. So we'll stick with images first here. Okay. So we made it to here. And uh, I'm not sure who those two people are, but you might know them. Uh, so I was really taken aback by the beauty of this building and the modern, uh, the modern history of architecture it represents. So I was really interested in taking this photo and I mean, luckily we had this funny doubling here, someone taking a picture inside while I was taking a picture outside. So, um, and that's partially what this um, exhibition is about, on a, again, on an uh, experiential level. Yes? If you just press that arrow down, you don't have to click in and out. Oh, yeah, that's true. I'll just do preview. Okay. I just didn't want that to happen in the back there. Um, here's a shot in the gallery. I thought that was sort of funny. Again, Hall of Mirrors effect, everyone looking at things. Um, okay, so here we are at the Sculpture Garden, and um, we're looking at a piece by Mary Miss. It's called, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember what it's called. But it's, um, it's at Governor State, and it's a very large structure, a piece of public art, land art even. And um, it is, you know, it is a cross between a kind of excavation site, a kind of um, monolithic um, kind of uh, structure that might refer to some other civilization possibly, but also with you know, a very modern look to it at the same time. It is quite old. It uh, was put in about 1983, I think a lot of these sculptures, maybe late 70s, early 80s. And, um, and uh, all of us were really taken aback by, again, the kind of history that is being inserted into some of these places, which are a little bit off the, the kind of thread that we're used to seeing in a sort of urban environment. So I was interested in locating these little bits of, um, you know, again, visual and historical information. So you just sort of see some of these histories played out, looking on the right, a kind of brutalist architecture, uh, and on the left there, the bridge is more of a glass curtain wall kind of structure developed by, you know, Mies van der Rohe and et cetera. So here's another monolithic, brutalist architecture type of thing. So, um, so then we moved on and we sort of took this really beautiful stroll uh, around the park and uh, to see this piece, which is in the background there. And this is called Divided House. And uh, it was very much on our minds um, as we've developed this project together as it was a place that, um, you know, is a, is a very, uh, is a very um, symbolic kind of structure to build. And Bruce Nauman himself had also said this in, in its placement. So this is a place, you know, thinking about the idea of a divided house and people being separated and people being um, divided from each other in, in, any, in any way or form, politically and um, otherwise, so. There's Josh. Um, this is the inside of the structure, really uh, kind of um, visceral uh, dirtiness on the inside and uh, this is what happens with public's, public art at times, but, um, retains kind of history that it's uh, of it being weathered and it being inhabited. But we were very taken aback that there was no graffiti inside the piece at all, not even one little scratch, which is really kind of a beautiful thing. If this were in a, another context, it might be um, a very nice canvas for someone else. So, um, 
So this is another sculpture, public sculpture, and I thought this was very fascinating to see that this yellow caution tape was put around it. Um, it just kind of ended up being kind of a beautiful little thing. Um, okay. So here's um, a piece by uh, artist Tony Tassett, who you might know from the giant eyeball that exists now in maybe coming down very soon, so if you make your way to Chicago, is it, is it down yet? Fifth? You might have missed it. Anyways, um, check this out. This is always up. And this is Paul Bunyan, and um, this is him right here. This is a very beautiful fiberglass sculpture, and it is, uh, it is based on vernacular sculpture of Paul Bunyan's around the country, particularly roadside Paul Bunyan's, and uh, so he had made this sculpture, which represented a kind of exhaustion, the exhaustion of kind of American, um, American confidence, American work ethic, and these kind of things. And uh, he's very tired after all this time. And um, one thing that was really nice to read was that he had modeled the beard and a lot of the face on a um, painting of Jesus in a Michelangelo painting. So, and that was very interesting to fold a little bit of that history and different histories all colliding in a way that was very complex. So, um, so we'll just move through. There's another kind of dramatic shot of it. Uh, yeah, so, and uh, so we had, you know, intended to arrive at the sculpture garden at dusk. So it became a very, uh, again, experiential type of thing. And um, a way to really, you know, spend some nice leisurely kind of, you know, time in an in a art context. So here's the Nauman piece lit up inside with an orange light. You start to see a little bit more of a you know, quality of light being manipulated here. Um, yeah, 1983. Um, here's another shot. There's the orange light. Okay. So, um, so that was our trip. I think that's pretty much it. Let's see. Okay, so about to show just a little bit. Um, as you might know, the uh, artists are all personal friends of mine, and they've all gone on to, um, you know, work in art in some capacity. Uh, they all are from area um, very close to here. So I thought it might be um, an interesting, again, marker, help us navigate uh, the different kinds of cultural context that exists in our, in our lives and our, uh, being able to sort of move from one context to another. So it was, a, it was a return to this place, but also a way to meditate on, um, you know, where does culture reside? Where does, um, where can, or where is a high art culture viable, a modern kind of, um, you know, way of looking at high art. So, um, so anyways, you have three artists working with three different strategies, and um, you have, um, John Almanza got four very, very abstract paintings, very um, obdurate, very stoic kind of paintings that uh, really don't give you a lot of content. Um, and that's one strategy for one to um, react to maybe their past or their origins, which is to provide something which is completely detached from it in some ways. Um, and there's possibly some way to read into it through thinking about oh, some of that color, texture being related to some kind of prior inner world or something, but really, um, partially it is a process piece which is located in the time and moment he was making them. Uh, so that's one strategy, and you have strategy by Ben Foch, which is a very reflexive kind of piece, um, which is of three individuals who um, have gone on to have significant uh, public careers um, that were three individuals who, had, um, who were also are from the same area um, around here. Uh, I, th I believe they might even have gone to your high school. Is that true? Okay, so yes. And um, so, you know, the reason um, I thought this would be good to include um, Ben and with this piece is that, you know, to show the breadth of his practice, you sort of see last show very much about abstract painting and architecture and et cetera. And this piece really more of a, a appropriation art piece uh, as well as a um, what kind of, you know, conceptual uh, maneuver. And then, um, but really a kind of presenting ready-made sort of 
sort of project. And then uh, lastly, you have Dennis Hodges, who has worked with um, you know, two media pieces, uh, but instead of just presenting them as is, they are you know, manipulated uh, to a degree to reduce them to a kind of, um, you know, to um, uh, isolate certain things for us to be able to analyze them a little bit uh, in more detail. So uh, that being said, um, maybe from here we can um, have some questions for me, either me or um, either two artists, or maybe I'll have a question for them. So, I know, we probably should keep moving. Yeah, we, can, we can go for 10 minutes or something. Yeah, we'll go real short, you guys. And, and yeah. Do you guys okay. want to step up to the... Yeah, why don't you go to them? And then students, if you, if you guys have any questions for Brandon uh, in terms of the show or his practice or for either of the artists, uh, if, if you've seen the show already, uh, ask, ask them questions about why they did what they did. You can jump in there. I, I guess, I mean, I'm curious about uh, maybe to talk a little bit more about the governor's state trip, because I, I think that sort of was kind of a foundation idea for you, but I'm not sure if that's uh, clear to everyone here, like what that has to do with this show and with your idea of sort of looking at place and looking at history. Okay. Um, for me personally, and I'm not sure when this came up to do this, it partially it was like, let's do this, it's going to be really fun. Um, but also it was a pilgrimage. It was literally a pilgrimage to see uh, much in the way a traditional pilgrimage might occur, which is to go to a place and, and uh, really spend time with the place and you know, pick apart uh, your um, um, you know, sort of relationship with, you know, with history and uh, with the object. So the Bruce Nauman uh, structure, sculpture, um, is pretty, um, was something I really wanted to see and was something, um, is an artist that I, you know, I look at quite a bit and, you know, I, I, I believe these, these guys do, um, being the iconic artist he is. Uh, so again, it was really a chance to see this thing in a very strange place, which is, um, you know, kind of far out from um, where maybe art context is. So it was a way to uh, draw us out to an environment we were not used to. Much like having a show for us, for me at least, um, to come here is, is, um, is um, you know, not having been invited by Josh would be um, maybe not on the radar at first. So, um, so, um, so really being invited to this was, was really a chance to, you know, think about what, would it, what does it mean to have art in these places? What does it mean to have art at Governor's State um, to make that initial investment? Can that be sustained? Um, you see some of those sculptures at the governor's state are in disrepair. They have to be covered with caution tape. Um, and maybe caution tape is like the thing that we should think about in terms of the sustainability of your own practice and the investment um, that a community like this or a community in general might try to think about as far as a bigger picture, which is where the title of the show is drawn from in terms of thinking about uh, Gauguin having migrated to Tahiti. So the Bruce Nauman, again, is a kind of way to uh, map out through proximity or distance, thinking about um, you know, how culture then disseminates into the world where culture might not exist in a way. Not not exist, but um, where it might not necessarily um, find its way by itself. So. Can I say something about it? Yeah, please All do. Right. Uh, I, I miss the pilgrimage, as you put it, unfortunately, because um, of scheduling. Uh, but I am familiar with this space because I grew up not far from there in uh, Madison, um, which is a suburb, you know, right in that uh, environs, not far from Park Forest, uh, where Rich East High School is. Um, but I was familiar with, with the, the sculpture garden before I had any real familiarity with fine art. Growing up out here, uh, I wasn't really exposed to much of what you might call high culture, if you want to describe it in those terms. Um, and so I, we would go to that place. We would go to that sculpture park as teenagers. Um, but our interest was not, was not an art. It was to try to find uh, a place where we had some privacy, where we could maybe do some things we weren't supposed to do. Um, because being out here in the suburbs, and this is where that piece, I think, connects with its location for me is that you know, Bruce Nauman's an internationally known artist, very important, very seminal artist. Um, but when you take an artwork like that uh, and you put it in a place, 
its use is going to be determined by the place it's put in. And so I think what's interesting about that piece and that place, uh, out here in the context of this sort of suburban environment, um, to me it just speaks of like that disconnect between uh, how art works in the world and how it's conceived in the studio. And Bruce Nauman, mind you, is, is a person who's very sensitive to that distinction. Um, but even in that way, I, you know, people end up using these things in ways that are not envisaged by the artist. Um, I wish I'd been on it, it looked, looked like a good trip, but uh, yeah, I mean, living out here in this sort of in-between space between rural and urban, uh, we often found ourselves with uh, a dearth of interesting things to do. And so we would have to, um, you know, in the moment, uh, work with the site we're in and respond to it, if you can describe a smoking pot in a field as such. Um, but, you know, Essentially, uh, now when I go to it, I know who Bruce Nauman is, but I interacted with that piece having no idea what it meant or who made it or why it was there. And it is kind of amazing, too, if you haven't been out there, uh, that uh, University Park, which I don't know what it's like now, but when I was growing up out here, it was a fairly empty place except for the university. Um, that it has such a world-class collection of sculpture is actually a pretty amazing opportunity. One that was wasted on me in my youth, but uh, clearly doesn't need to be wasted on the rest of you. But maybe it wasn't wasted. You know, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I don't know if this is working, but... Um, Do you want to just yeah, use uh, Dennis's... You know, I, I kind of wonder if it, you know, if, if there is an impact that having access to that at an age, I wonder if it did have an impact to, at some extent. I think that's what I was interested in investigating, um, is to, to come at it from one angle, just growing up, youth, whatever, you're not familiar with the content of Bruce Nauman's work, but to then, you know, after being exposed to that type of practice, to then to return to something, so you, you can kind of connect with this object in two ways. I guess that's what was interesting for me to go down there. I don't imagine Bruce Nauman would be disappointed in that kind of use of one of his spaces, yeah. though, anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't say maybe, maybe if I hadn't experienced that in that way then, uh, maybe, you know, maybe we wouldn't be here today. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. it's hard. hard to say. That's interesting to me because, you know, in a show like this, which is fairly really highly conceptualized uh, in the way that you pull this together in the bit of the work, I think particularly of yours that this, you know, appropriated images. Mm-hmm. Sure. This is their second semester of college. Um, that really may approach that may approach a show like this with that same kind of um, without the uh, the specialized knowledge that makes the encounter with a Bruce Down piece um, or a Super O piece or you know able to create some distinction between the um, the, the, uh, the tired old Paul Bunyan and Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the way that that uh, um, the atmosphere that surrounds a, a work like that will affect a person before they have the specialized knowledge. Yeah, it could have a, a long-term impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the meaning of these things is largely determined by the sort of cultural capital you bring to them. Yeah. Exa yeah I would say that's a yeah. maybe a more useful way to reframe that. Yeah. Um, than what I was trying to say before, but that's, yeah, I think that's essentially. Um, with, with Ben's piece, one has to wonder uh, what the experience of those three people was when they were uh, undergoing their formative time at Rich East right. High School Go Rockets, and um, it is Rockets, right? It's Rockets, yeah, green and gold. Um, but w one has to imagine that the kind of place they come from, in terms of cultural capital and world experience, has to be vastly different now. I mean, perhaps not. I don't, I don't know how they grew up, but one would imagine, I mean, just me coming from a similar place uh, where I am now is very different. So I can imagine being a famous basketball player or, you know, a musician or yeah. actor. It must be very different. 
I wonder if anyone has any questions about the pieces specifically, since we're here and willing to answer. Make one up. I thought the work was bulletproof, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this, this might be a more general, this doesn't answer your, or ask the question that maybe you're asking, but maybe more pointedly toward Brendan, but um, this is a question I consistently grapple with and in thinking about your, your history and kind of shift in school to needing a more formal art education, I, I consistently come back to this question of why, why I ask that my practice be considered art and the work that I make or want to do creatively in the world be considered art. And what I'm asking of art sure. in that sense or what the art world wants from me sure. or this art or cultural, or cultural capital or cultural world um, is seeking from calling my work art. Because often I think it doesn't quite fit yeah, or isn't quite traditionally there or isn't just like painting a cover right to a um, Publication or something sure. like that. So um, it seems like a lot of your work has this um, touch or dab of things that are considered obviously art, but then there's this heavy conceptual conceptual side, or or maybe what um, what's being alluded to is this need for um, education in order to understand. Um, I think part of it, and I think um, John Almanza's painting function this way is that the painting is a rectangle and we have, um, I would assume that almost everyone has some kind of, some initial understanding of how to read a painting. Um, and you know, the books, uh, again, they might be esoteric information, they might not be, um, but to make their formal qualities um, something to grab someone, you know. So it's something that is um, uh, able to create that portal uh, for someone to then uh, move into and perhaps investigate further. So it's um, so it's like not like you would have this education and then you can understand this. Is that maybe these books or artworks? Um, it's, it, I guess it, what I'm saying is it's an organic process for me, yeah. and these meanings are continually um, having to be made and having to be made used um, for your own purposes. Much like going to the Bruce Nauman um, sculpture. You know, we sort of use that as a place to have experience, but also to point out it's there to this group. Right. So part of it for me is a, um, you know, I, I um, as m myself, not, not speaking for them, but a lot of the projects that I um, continually make and move towards uh, almost exclusively making non-end products, so products that aren't uh, ever going to lay still, that where it's, it's a tool for another person, um, generally, or it's a platform for another person. Um, so again, it's a kind of economic system where everyone gains without, you know, I, I guess, without having to deal with certain other uh, aspects of end products, such as waste and things like that. So, um, so that brings up a good point for me, though. Is and and sorry if this is super reduced, but I know. Um, so why why would doing um, being a publisher not just reside as a publisher rather than, why does it need art? And, and I, I, I see a lot of reasons why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Like, yeah. Why, um, why not just... Yeah. yeah, Brandon, why is that? Yeah, well, <laughs> part of it is that for me, um, the art context can afford uh, people um, a certain zone or um, history to experiment with ideas like this and by no means would I like for it to stay in the art world at all actually and um, part of trying to provide tools for people and things is uh, you know, perhaps to make them um, able to produce or think about their art in a further, you know, further their art um, but if it, if it, um, if it, I don't know, I mean the, for me the question is it art or not is not as um, pressing I guess and um, which is not to say I ignore it, but I find after having had all this education, I find myself thinking, well, how do I make this art not just be art anymore, but how does it push out in the world, which is why the books were very 
um, compelling for me to continue with because it implies other things and um, can't exist in other economies. So I think, um, but yeah, but I think the art world provides me, A, with a fair level of fair use uh, potential, A, um, which is sort of like, um, you know, a doctrine which involves how much you use appropriated material, right? right. So as an artist, you have that, you have that um, play and that liberty to be able to do that. Um, whereas as a commercial publisher, I would not be able to publish any of that because I would be making money off of it, uh, which is not to say I wouldn't want to make money off of my art. Um, but that, again, there's a kind of um, freedom of expression kind of clause in um, the language that the Library of Congress uses and other things where there should be a um, provisions for an author to experiment and press culture in a way where more um, uh, other contexts cannot, I guess, in a way. So, but it's, it's, it's not a distinction that I make with a line, it's more of a spectrum, I guess. So, um, and you know, moving forward with this storefront, um, you know, the projects lined up do push out into, um, you know, into the world more with the you know, uh, writing context than, um, you know, entrepreneurial context. So I think you're finding me, and that's a great question to ask right now, that um, sure, you know, we're thinking about, I'm thinking about this broader sp spectrum of activity or process now with anyone, um, because these, you know, these sorts of, uh, this sort of thinking is, should not, and I don't think is relegated only to art, definitely, which is why I presented this show in the, uh, uh, here in the way it is, because, you know, the hope that is that, I mean, not to uh, say um, that this is the Bruce Nauman for your uh, average person, but, you know, um, just bringing sort of different ideas, or sort of reflexive ideas to the table, which I think art also can do a little um, more robustly than maybe some other context, I suppose. So, I don't know if that answered your question or not. So. Can I give you a little bit of a hard time, Brandon? Sure. Okay. Um, the question I heard asked was more like, um, why you're doing this sort of publishing, uh, this sort of nonprofit publishing with its own rationale, why does that also need to be art? Whereas I feel like you answer the opposite question of like, I'm doing this art practice, why does it expand beyond the art context? Um, and I, I only bring it up and I don't know, you know, know that I'm asking for any different answer from you, but because that's something I've been thinking about myself a lot, actually. Um, which is, what is the justification for the art context? Because that's what art is, is essentially a context. Um, and what does it have that other contexts might not have? And I think in a lot of cases, the answer, art might not have a very good answer for that. Because um, it's something we love, we shouldn't let it off the hook so easily. Uh, a lot of what I've um, been doing, I uh, moved away from a kind of conventional studio practice because for a lot of reasons, it doesn't make sense to me anymore. Um, economically speaking, even as a model, it doesn't make sense. This idea that uh, a producer would make a product that there's no demand for yet uh, and sink resource, like endless resources, into the production of this thing they haven't, they, you know, they, they, there's not even necessarily a market for, and then even spend money to store the surplus um, is a sort of a strange economic model for the 21st century. Um, what I, so what I appreciate are situations like this more, where there's a sp or like your staircase piece, uh, where there's a specific space or a specific context to respond to. I think art still has a lot to do there. But in other cases, in terms of studio practice, I'm not sure it makes as much sense to keep doing that. Uh, I've supplanted studio practice of like making sculptures and stuff with um, crafting beer. Um, which I'll tell you is far more rewarding in terms of, uh, or at least it seems that way when you're drinking it, I have to tell you. Uh, but friends of mine had said, well, why don't you bring that into a gallery context? Why don't you, you know, display this as art? Why don't you make this your studio practice? You know, and I don't understand, and I, something about it feels wrong to like do something that has its own rationale and its own value, and then to try to also get this sort of extra art credit for it, it seems a little disingenuous. So. Um, I think that that question is one we should keep answering, um, keep asking, and... Uh, it's funny that the thing that leaves a bad taste in your mouth is exactly what makes me like art. I, I like that it has no immediate use value and that you're not, you're creating a market and not servicing a market. You know, like that's the distinction, right? And, mm -hmm. there, and even in economic models, 
in publishing is a kind of a classic example um, that you can be a publisher that prints things that the majority of people want to read, which would be romance novels. And those things will sell easy. And they're easy to produce. They're easy to write. They don't take a ton of talent. There's a model. Mm -hmm. You can write that novel. Um, and it will sell, and you'll make a ton of money. And you can, it doesn't have to be an expensive book. It can be a, a cheap book. And then there's art house publishing companies that'll find really dense, esoteric writers, but it's obviously higher quality, but they're gonna have less sales. There's not, there's not a big market for it. They're trying to create a market for their, their artists, authors, or whatever, just real quick. Um, so, but the difference is the difference of the quality of the experience, right? So art might not be necessary, but I, I think it raises the quality of our overall experience because it's not necessary. So it, it's this like extra thing. It's the difference between eating hot dogs or eating lobster. Like you can survive on hot dogs, but I mean, this is essentially, I'd rather not. <laughs> this is essentially Greenberg's argument though from avant-garde and kitsch. Yeah, it is. I'm I'm old school. Sure, old no, school I know. Modernist. I know that, and I I'm not surprised that we disagree on this a little. But what my concern is is, first of all, let's not confuse the fact that art might not have an uh, immediately obvious or widely ranging use value, mm -hmm. with the idea that it has no use value, because mm -hmm. I don't believe that for a second. And sometimes it has an all too political and monetary sure. use value sure. as well. Sure, the ideal is that. It has no use value, but yes, it definitely has real use value, real function in the world. And sometimes that function is pretty sinister. But, but to, go, to come back to the example of Brandon, why is this activity art and not just a publisher? The reason is because if he was really just trying to be a publisher, he would just be completely unsuccessful. No one would buy those books. Like, he wouldn't be able to afford to get the, the, the right, like, his whole economic equation would change to this point where he just couldn't produce. But art, the art context allows him to just produce. He doesn't have to function in an economic system. I mean, to what degree is the art context necessary for that project to pay for itself, and to what degree does it pay for it? I it, have to um, ask. It doesn't pay for itself at all. Yeah. Yeah. So you could easily do the same thing on your own, with your own, uh, intentions and your own goals and your own uh, means of judging your success that have nothing to do with the art world. But then he would yeah. never create a market for himself yeah, in the future. I think the art world does provide audience of some sort and it allows a person to pursue a completely financially unviable production practice of some sort mm -hmm. uh, without the burden of, um, you know, it's, it's like uh, starting a business, you know, artists start business And they do it without a loan in any rate, it usually, is. yeah. In other words, it's a labor of love in a certain sense. I've thought about this idea as well. I'm actually in Toronto's question. Mm -hmm. the, the, the whole like relational aesthetics idea um, and what does make Sunday suit art. I think it seems like a labor of love in the moment, but I actually think that it's just a very long art, long term investment. So, like, the reward actually potentially is just in an unforeseeable, virtually non-existent future. Using the term labor of love refers yeah. to something that you're going to dump a lot of money and yeah. never see anything like yeah. that. So I often see. I don't people, think that's most people's intention. I don't think that they're thinking like, oh, I'm just going to throw this money away. I think it's like, even if it's unconscious, I think they have a desire that in the long, 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 long term, this will pay off. I don't imagine anyone ever thinks they're throwing money away. I, ma I imagine whatever things people buy, they imagine have value. Yeah. Well, um, ben, ben, it's, again, it's their... an exchange, but it's not, a, 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 it's not a capitalist exchange in that yeah. you're exchanging goods for money. You're exchanging goods, work for, if you want to call yeah. this relational capital. Yeah, like yes. Relationship. And you spoke a lot about relationship, and I know you guys. Well, or you start seeing artists that become curators Mm -hmm. professors become, mm -hmm. um, educators become community organizers. Like Sunday Soup, would, they'd never say that was art. Yeah. 
maybe they're art administrators. They're very um, art administrators, right? Yeah. They're very adamant about not identifying as artists. Right. It's yeah. a funding source. I I think that Brandon's practice, like to do curating as production, um, you know, it, it's strange to, <clears throat> but I how do I explain this? Um, you know, I, I see it as an extension, as a pictorial extension, right? I'm thinking about this activity as being a living, breathing sculpture, right? That he's actually using time and space as medium, um, location as a medium, history as a medium, my practice, my production, his practice, like all of these things as being like, each one is, a, is like a single stroke in a, on a pictorial plane. And he's making a composition um, and it's, it's painting sculpture. It just happens to function in the world. I hate to shut it down right now, but I think we should probably wrap it up right now, unless, unless you guys really want to uh, keep hashing it out, but maybe we could continue later. Um, you got pizza here? Unless there's any dangling uh, issues. Or Last chance, students. We'll wait for one question. That's what I do with my class. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just stay silent and make yeah. it uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. This was, yeah. No? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the Oprah piece, maybe just a quick explanation of that. OK. Um, that's Dennis Hodges' piece. I will um, talk to you about my sort of um, intentions behind selecting that piece. Um, partially, um, it's a piece that I've seen in um, being produced. It's something that is very um, um, topical right now, as Oprah is now departing our fair city, well, Chicago. Um, so as a way to think about who a cultural leader might be, what kind of force are they? Um, and drawing that con distinction, much like Ben is with his um, piece in the show, which is to um, put, put into, um, you know, isolate and um, put into a severe contrast with being within a very um, modernist, clean art gallery type of context in a way. So really it's, um, about locating um, that field, that field of sort of um, celebrity kind of power structure, that kind of thing. So I don't know, maybe if you have any words about that piece, sure. it would be, yeah, just to. Yeah, um, um, a lot of the work I do uh, deals with appropriated uh, media like that. Um, I set my DVR to record like Oprah all the time, and then I sit and I watch it. and. Uh, <laughs> And then general hospitals. No, I'm kidding. Um, and uh, I have really mixed feelings about Oprah, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people probably do. Um, I know she has a lot of really strong fans, and then she has a lot of detractors as well. And there's a lot of things you could say about her, but you have to admit that she has a powerful cultural relevance to people. What I wanted to do was somehow keep portray her as a kind of cultural leader in a more abstract and less commercial sense. I wanted to create uh, a feeling of a social space, which is done in that piece through the use of canned ambient sound to create this, like the uh, auditory space of a lecture hall. And then, uh, and it would be disingenuous to pretend, you know, that I'm not uh, pulling her strings to a large degree by editing what she says. But I try to let her say the kinds of things she, she says over and over again, but in a very general kind of way, taking out a lot of the specificity of her statements so that you can maybe get a kind of feel of Oprah at the pulpit almost. Um, and I, I mean, I have strong negative and positive feelings about Oprah. I think she represents a few uh, good changes in the lives of her fans, people that probably need her help a lot in some cases, and in other cases, she really misguides people in terrible ways. Um, but I don't want to insert my feelings about that as much into the piece, and I want to let the viewer kind of uh, feel Oprah without her content as much, if that makes sense. Feel Oprah's show more as a, a kind of form. Um, I don't know if that works or not, but that's my intention. And thank you for your question.
Thanks, you guys. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks, everyone.